when the typewriter um, first was invented, um, uh, it was uh, the, the, the the sort of um, concurrent to that, the QWERTY um, arrangement of keys was invented. And um, originally, actually before that, they had um, keyboards that were that were like piano keyboards, which is why we call a, a typewriter keyboard a keyboard. Uh, or, a, or a computer keyboard, a keyboard, um, because they evolved out of the piano keyboard. They thought that this would be the, the optimal way for people to, uh, to enter um, text into, uh, or to, uh, to type text. Uh, it's, a, it's a little bit silly when we look at it now, but it shows you how, um, you know, how things you know, radically change. But there's a little bit of a mythology that kind of grew up around the, um, around the keyboard, uh, and there's two different stories of how the whole QWERTY um, arrangement evolved. Uh, if you've ever spoken to anybody who um, uses a different kind of a keyboard layout than QWERTY, um, you might you might have heard the story about um, you know the sort of speed of typing, where um, the original uh, typewriters with their um, w with the keys that sort of uh, you know, you use the ribbon and, and, and actually wrote uh, onto the paper would would get tangled up if people typed too quickly. So they intentionally made the QWERTY keyboard more difficult to use, so that typists couldn't type so quickly that th that the machine itself would get tangled up in itself. So that's sort of one thread of the mythology. And the other the other one is that um, is that they made an unusual arrangement so that they could um, have a monopoly on the uh, on the on the teaching and the and the sort of uh, you know the the business around teaching people how to use this uh, complicated um, typing method. So um, now we're not sure whether either either of those is really true. But suffice it to say that once once an, um, a, a standard like this establishes itself, it's very very difficult to rip it back out again. And even if it's not the most optimal method for for doing this, um, it it sort of it has this kind of crazy longevity. So if we look at um, you know we see we you see QWERTY in the in the, in the earliest um, keyboards, and then it, it it so quickly became the standard that it was you know it was adopted and carried through, and you know you got it in um, you know all of the manual um, typewriters, and then here's a here's an Atari. Um, you know, one of the early word processing machines. And again, we still have the QWERTY keyboard. We still have the exact same arrangement uh, because it's, it's so embedded in the practice and the use of it in the everyday lives of all of the people who, who require this for, for whatever they're doing, their businesses. Um, and then, you know, we can bring that forward into, you know, when we get into the age of mobile, the early, you know, um, you know machines that we're looking at. Again, we still have QWERTY. We still have the same basic kind of layout and um, you know, up to Mac, we still have we're still there. This inefficient sort of uh, system is still sort of carrying through um, uh, right into uh, iOS 7. Um, and interestingly, the guy who invented the QWERTY layout, he wasn't satisfied with it. He didn't think it was necessarily the be all and end all, and he kept writing new patents for different arrangements. But because QWERTY had gotten so sort of you know, well adopted and universally used, and everybody, you know, sort of was comfortable with it. And none of that ever took off. So you can see this is this is an actual patent application that he put together, um, where he has a totally different, um, you know, uh, you know, main, uh, you know, root. I can't remember exactly what they call it. It's the sort of I'm trying to remember from my typing classes from high school. Home. <laughs> There you go. That's the one. Um, so the, the, there's an entirely different uh, set of letters for, for this particular patent that he was looking for. Um, so, you know, if we think about, you know, how the user um, enters information or how, and how the user works with a system, you know, um, if you looked at uh, Dries's keynote, um, you know, the, we, we talked about simplifying the user journey, um, and, and that's also true here. You know, we want to we want to try to simplify the authoring experience and simplify the user journey as much as we can. So we go back and and, and take a look at this. Um, you know, it again, it's all about the experience, and if we go back before the web, we can see that the, that the experience was very complicated. 
um, and uh, it uh, it took quite a lot of time. You you had you know handwritten notes, which you would then make into an outline. Maybe you might mail that to somebody to share that with them and get their input on it. Approval could be over the telephone. Um, you know you had to then send this this work to a designer. Say you were in a publication like a newspaper or a magazine or a. Uh, a, a book before the before the days of the web, and then if you wanted photography, there was you know real film and photography that had to be developed and and composited and typeset and film needed to be shot of an entire uh, um, of an entire piece and then made into plates that got printed and and delivered and then sold on a newsstand or in a bookstore. So it was a very long process for the author to get their message, you know, to the end user, and we simplified that quite a lot. You know, so in the age of, you know, the static web when, you know, people wrote HTML by hand, um, but you still had to, you still had the same kind of, you know, processes. You started with your notes, you create an outline, maybe you email that around to a, a few collaborators to sort of get feedback on, share it. Maybe your editor uh, approves that, uh, again, by email. Uh, but again, still design. A designer has to take that from there, and, and then a coder makes it into HTML and publish it to the publishes publishes it to the web, um, and now uh, you know. Currently, um, we have you know a situation where people are starting to use mobile devices to sort of take notes or sort of you know. Um, there's a lot of sort of Evernote and a lot of other apps where you're where you're you're getting your thoughts down immediately wherever you are in the context of what you're doing, so that you don't have to go back and sit down at your computer at a later point. You don't have to, and you also don't have to use a piece of paper that you know you would then have to transfer onto the computer. So you have this, you know, these this note taking capability, but oftentimes that's not really connected to the uh, the mode in which you share the information. So you might t you might be taking your notes and then transferring your notes into an email and sending that to somebody, or you might be putting it into a Google Doc, and then you're collaboratively working on. You know, oftentimes at Acquia, we 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 do this. We'll put a Google Doc together before somebody publishes a blog post, and several people will comment on it. You know, in the Google Doc, and it, it becomes a um, you know that that's the forum. That, that becomes the way that you uh, that you revise and, and and extend and expand your thoughts until it's in in a, in, a, in a state where you where you want it to be. But the problem is that at that point you want to move this into the CMS. And when we get to the CMS, when we get to Drupal, right? You have to copy and paste. Maybe you're copying from Word. Maybe you're copying from some uh, desktop, um, you know, application. But I think more often these days you are you're copying from Google Docs or from some other collaborative collaborative editing platform. Maybe you're using Evernote or something else like that, um, and your formatting is completely lost. You know, in Drupal 8, we introduced um, the capability of having uh, your format come with you from from a Word document, but that's not true of Google Docs. Um, Google, all the formatting in Google is, 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 is in there with JavaScript and spans, and everything is completely gone by the time you paste it into uh, 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 Drupal. So then you're going back and you're adding back all of the formatting that you had when you put together your, your collaborative um, you know, editing process, and then there might be an additional sort of um, you know, uh, workflow process after that, at the end of that, right? So, um, so you had a sort of a you had a collaborative process in working in Google Docs, and then it went into and got it reformatted, and then. But now I also have a workflow. I have Workbench installed, and you know, and and then I have an editor who has to approve it, and then they're going to say, okay, that's good to go. We publish it. We push it live. Um, so it's still a fairly you know compl complicated and convoluted process. But what we really want is something much more simpler than that. You know, we want we want a situation where where all of the note taking and the editing and the collaborating and the sort of formatting occurs in one place, right? All in a single sort of environment where, you, where you, nothing ever gets lost because this kind of loss and sort of rewriting and reformatting is, it's painful. It's, it's, not, it's not an optimal experience really for anybody. And how much, however much we have improved um, content authoring in Drupal 8 by adding, you know, by adding edit in place and adding and adding uh, CK editor, which is awesome. These problems still persist, um, 
and, uh, and they will persist into the future. So we have to think about where we're going to go next with this. Um, so uh, going back to the keyboard for a minute, um, I want to I wanna just dive into some of the current sort of trends and, 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 and places where things are going uh, you know, with the keyboard itself and with, and with text input. So, um, because the landscape of this is changing really, really rapidly, and, um, and we're going to need to adapt to that. We're going to need to, f to figure out how we, you know, how we cope with these, with these totally new paradigms that we're going to be seeing. So, um, uh, you can see that, you know, right off the bat, a, a lot of people use uh, a Dvorak keyboard, uh, which is, um, you know, which solves this QWERTY problem. You know, we saw, we saw um, you know, how so we, we, we've, we've inherited this ridiculous QWERTY arrangement, which is, which is not optimal for typing. Um, so the Dvorak keyboard completely rearranges uh, all of the keys and lets you type uh, more, supposedly lets you type more efficiently. And a, a lot of people at Acquia use that. I personally never could type either way particularly fast. So um, I'm always just sort of hunting and pecking with two fingers. But, um, you know, it, this, is, this is at least um, a start of an effort in the direction of, of sort of optimizing this. But let's look at, you know, a couple of other things. Um, so obviously we have we have all of our vowels in the home in the home area rather than um, you know the, the qwerty which doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, you want to have the you know the things that are there most often. But then you know but now we have we have swipe you know I mean we have swipe keyboards in Android devices and you have swipe keyboards in apps uh, on iOS and uh, you know and, and on desktops and, and and on Windows devices. So you know how do those two things mesh together? If people are using swipe, and, but they're swiping on a QWERTY keyboard, that doesn't really even make any sense anymore. You know, I mean, the, the, the home keys are there, you know, so because, you, because you, had, you type with two hands. But, you know, swiping is a totally different, um, is a totally different experience. Um, why do we have that? It's, it, it doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, you have, swipe, you have swipe also on your, on your um, you know, on your phone. Uh, if you have an Android device, or you can have it, you can set it to your keyboard. But it's not, again, it's it's not universal. It it uh, it's something that's available for some for some users and not for others. For instance, iOS, you can't set your global uh, keyboard to to a swipe keyboard. You can uh, you can have an app. Here's a couple of apps that I have used, which are really interesting for this. One is Path Input, where you can have uh, a, a swipe keyboard for for uh, for iOS, and the other one is Flesky. Which is not a swipe keyboard, but it's a it's a it's a keyboard that sort of um, uh, is adapting to you and sort of uh, figuring out uh, uh, how to auto complete your words based on a, a database that it compiles of, of of your most commonly used words and the and uh, and the patterns that you use to type them. But both of those are really uh, excellent. And then you also have like voice and um, and dictation stuff happening. Uh, and then you have things like Markdown. Um, and uh, you know, if we go back and if we go back and we think about these, all of these aren't really coming together yet in a kind of a way that's um, that makes sense and that sort of ties it all together. So if we go back to our Dvorak keyboard, right, you can see that um, you know it 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 moves all of the most common uh, the the most commonly used letters into the middle, you know, where they will be where they will be easily used, but. This doesn't really necessarily work with with swipe, and it doesn't it doesn't really even work well with you know with, just with touch. Um, first of all, they're squares. That doesn't really make any sense. You want to have you want to have um, something that maps more closely to the uh, the human factors, to your actual fingertips. Your fingertips are not square. Um, and then the next thing is that if you are using swipe, say you wanted to say you wanted to swipe student, the word student. Well, you can see that because all of my uh, all of my letters are in a row, right? Uh, it, it's a much more difficult job for the pattern recognition to figure out that I'm typing student because I'm going back and forth across all of these letters several different times. So if um, you know, if, if 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 we were to, and also it's set up, you know, it's set up horizontally for people for, for sort of two hand typing. But if we were to think about this in a slightly different way. You know, and rearrange things so that you uh, so that you staggered the letters and then you brought them all together. Something like this makes much much more sense for swipe. This is student again in that in that format. 
you know, so I have a, I have a, I have a, a way to more easily move around, and I can, and I can see where I'm going. And additionally, one of the other problems with the swipe keyboards, I don't, how many people have actually used a swipe keyboard? Just out of curiosity, so quite a lot. So, um, how many people have had a had a problem with a swipe keyboard where your finger is in the way of the letters? Have you have you have you seen that? Yeah, yeah, it's 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 problematic. I find that it, it it works quite well if you're using a stylus, but but when you're but on a phone, your finger gets in the way of the letters. So I don't see this as necessarily a really kind of efficient way. Uh, even if you make improvements like this of users of authors, you know, authoring content in Drupal, you know, w with the swipe keyboard. But there's a lot of other things uh, happening. And then the other question is: is the, isn't this the responsibility of the device? You know, well, when, when we're, when we're uh, you know, thinking about our CMS, right, we're thinking about, you know, what, 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 what does the CMS do and what does, the, what does the device do? And we kind of sort of push off all of these other sort of, you know, uh, all of these other usability questions onto the device and leave it in their hands and say, oh, well, you know, I mean, we don't have to worry about that. We'll just give them, we'll give them a, um, a WYSIWYG and then they can, they can, they can format their text but how they actually get the text in there, that's not our, that's not our problem. That's not our business. But I think we should think about it. We should think about it as our business because we should be thinking about the whole user journey. And it's not just that it's our responsibility or our problem. It's our opportunity, right, as a community to, to seek out what, you know, what the entire experience is and see how much of it we can really encompass with what we do. So that's, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that um, later on. So one of the things that we've come across uh, in the authoring improvements in Drupal 8 uh, that may be a problem that we are going to have to think about more creatively and differently is that um, despite the fact that we've, that we've got uh, CK Editor and that we've got Edit in Place and that we've got a lot of really much more effortless tools for, for entering uh, uh, text and for authoring things in Drupal, we are still fighting with the devices. So how many of you have used uh, CK Editor in Drupal 8 uh, on an iPhone or on an Android device or, or, or tried it out? So, Yorei, or Boyan, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, it's not easy. Um, it, because the device is fighting with you. It's, it's, it's great, it's, it's tremendous on a, on a desktop or laptop device, but as soon as you get into the context of mobile, um, the, the devices are getting in your way. They're throwing, up the, um, they're throwing up their tools right in front of the WYSIWYG tools. Uh, and this is, a, this is really problematic, you know, because there's nothing we can really do to get around that. We can't turn off the device tools. The device tools are going to be there no matter what we do. And what happens in this, in this instance is in order to use this, you have to scroll out of the way. You have to scroll the, you have to scroll the device controls away from, from where, you're, from where you're, um, your cursor is. And in some instances, if you have, if you have uh, specific types of controls uh, uh, under there, by the time you've scrolled it away, you've deselected the word that you had selected and you can't even do the thing you wanted to do. So it's really, really difficult and, and we, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out a way to get around this and what we found out was that, you know, we were just going to have to live with it the way it is. Um, but, and then in addition to that, the device is providing redundant functionality, which is confusing to the user. See, you can see here that you have bold and underline um, uh, underneath or on top of in the in the iOS device tools, um, your bold and underline that you have in your CK editor. So um, somebody might ha might might easily get the impression that they could bold something using the device tools in iOS and that it's going to be bolded. But that's not going to be saved into your database. It will bold on the screen if you bold something. It's going to it's going to bold it. But it's not bolding it. Uh, it's it, CK Editor is not bolding it. It's not getting it's not getting written into your database. So, these this is another one of the problems that we that we are um, you know encountering and that we're going to need to think about. Um, so, you know, a, a lot of these issues around you know uh, a, uh, an application or a device control can be overcome uh, in the context of an app. 
Um, you know, it's just when we're in the context of HTML in the browser that we come across these problems. So it begs the question, sh you know, should we think about uh, solutions, you know, in Drupal that use an app to, um, uh, or use something that's more on the client side to, to, to deal with these issues? Um, so, uh, but w when, we, when we talk about I issues with input and issues with, uh, with, with text and, and keyboards and, 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 and WYSIWYGs and all of those things, there's a whole other range of things that we're not even thinking about which are coming on the line. So the, 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 the content author's journey starts with input, right? And we need to understand where, where all of these new methods of input are going because this is really, really a very exciting area. So um, we have glass. Um, glass, obviously, you're not writing things with glass, but you have, uh, you have input with glass. You, know, you have a Boolean, you know, blink, which is yes or no or, or submit or, you know, or cancel. Uh, so y you have that ability, and it's not too difficult to imagine, um, you know, coupling glass with voice recognition and being able to look at a document and, and speak your text and then sort of, you know, use your WYSIWYG tools, um, you know, w with, your, with your glass controls. So you also have style, you know, things, things that use a stylus I mentioned before, um, but this is, uh, you know, can be very slow. Um, has anybody seen this this film? Her. Um, it's really interesting because, uh, I, and I, I think it's wrong in a lot of respects because it, it it shows this world in which this guy is talking. He's using voice control in the office to sort of write. He's a kind of a writer. He writes people's letters for them, which is a kind of a, it's a strange quirk of the movie. A rewriter, right? He rewrites people's letters. But um, it, 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 it brings up this, this issue, which is um, something that comes, comes up with voice, which is that nobody wants to speak a personal email or, or a correspondence in the middle of a crowded office where, where there are people standing all around them. But there are things that are arising now which sort of overcome that. Um, you know, you, so Dragon Speech Recognition has been around uh, for, for some time, and it works, and it works quite well. But you're not going to speak private correspondence. You're not going to want to do that. Um, and the other thing is that it strains your vocal cords. If you're if you're an author or a, you know a, you know um, a journalist and you're re and you're speaking all day long, uh, it's even this is even worse than carpal tunnel syndrome. You you really get vocal strain. People have um, severe problems with this already. Um, uh, character and pattern pattern recognition is what's being used for um, you know for for the uh, for the for the stylus stuff. Um, and all of these things are using, you know, these kind of forms of recognition. But this has problems with speed. You know, you can't, uh, you can't write in longhand as fast as you can type. Um, you may be able to use your stylus to swipe uh, faster than you can type. Um, but there's other interesting things on the horizon coming up very soon, which is uh, things such as subvocal speech recognition, where um, y you're actually not really even speaking. You're you're just thinking, I'm going to say this, and, um, and, 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 a, and, a, and a voice recognition very similar to Dragon is actually, uh, is actually reading that. But it's not quite ready for prime time yet. It has, still has problems with accuracy. But this technology and other technologies around sort of sub-audible, you know, highly sensitive microphones are, are going to come together to form a, 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 a new form of input where, where you, know, you don't really need a keyboard at all. You don't need, you don't need um, a, a stylus or a keyboard or anything like that. And how are we going to deal with that when that comes along? You know, our, how are we going to, how does that mesh with a WYSIWYG editor? How does that mesh with text input in Drupal? Um, you know, these are questions that are, that, that are, that are going to need to be asked. So, and then ad additionally, we have a lot of, a lot of stuff happening ab about, um, you know, the intelligence of the device or the intelligence of the application. So we have things like autocomplete, uh, autocorrect, which, you know, gets a lot of uh, 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 humor on the internet. Um, and, uh, you know, other things like, uh, you know, essentially these auto-comprehend tools where it's like, you know, it's figuring out what, what, you, what you were going to say or what, it fi or what it thinks you might say and then sort of auto-filling uh, those in. All of these things, one of the interesting things about these things is that they all compile a database on you and on your specific habits uh, and they use that 
to, to build on this, this sort of recognition and improve it over time. Uh, Nuances tools use that, and, and a lot of the other, other tools. Are, they're building up a database that's going to be uh, something that, that, that is specific to you. It's not sort of general. Um, and then, uh, you know, there's something that I'd call uh, contextual input. And we already see this with things like, um, you know, photos in your, uh, on your devices. So if, you're, um, if, if you go out and you take a photo uh, on an iOS device, that's uh, geotagged. And it's given a lot of, um, you know, it's given a lot of meta information based on where you were, the time of day, you know, and, and, and a, lot of other, a lot of other factors, what, what device you were using, et cetera. Um, but it's not hard to see very soon in the future a situation in which all of the, all of the input uh, that you create uh, of, of text is also meta tagged in this exact same way. So... So, so your system can, can know and read back to you, oh, you said this at night, or you said this you know, in bad weather, or this is something that you wrote you know, at this particular time in this particular place, and then be able to use these recognition techniques to make some sense of that and to give it back to you in, 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 a, in a more contextual way. So that could lead to something which I would call auto-compose, so um, imagine you wrote, I started an email and I said, or, a, or a document, and I said, you know, one of the problems with using web fonts is, and then it prompted me, you know, on December 12th, 2013, you wrote this, right? You've already said this. You've already written this stuff. Do you want to just use that and, and or edit it and, 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 uh, and add to it and extend it? And, and extend it? So it's kind of, in a sense, replacing your memory. It's like it's sort of extending and 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 uh, and adapting to and uh, enhancing your ability to author and 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 sort of compose ideas and, and bring things together. Um, and that's really just the beginning of of that kind of thing. But one of the things that this really sort of um, leads to, or one of the questions that this leads to, is should you know, w with all of these capabilities, right, with all of these possible modes of input uh, and with all of these problems that we have with, um, you know, fighting with the device and not having a, 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 a sort of a, a mesh between the, the device and what we're trying to do with Drupal, you know, which is give people an authoring experience that makes sense and that's effortless and easy, does it really make sense for us to continue to push on authoring being, uh, you know, on the server side? And should authoring really be on the client side? Should we be working on a solution that, um, that brings authoring over to the client side or something, you know, that bridges that gap in a better way? I mean, we have authoring right now. Again, we have this situation where, you know, I take notes, I share, I copy, I, 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 use, I use Google Docs or some other method, and then I still have to do this reformatting. I have to bring it over the gap. You know, how can we remove those steps from this process? Um, and I think that, um, you know, there's a couple of ways that I think that we could do this, that we could, uh, that we could look towards. Uh, the, the first one is um, authoring on a content server, right? This doesn't necessarily solve the problems of, um, it doesn't necessarily solve the problems of, um, I, uh, you know, I want some specific form of input that I don't, that I don't have available to me in a browser like, like, uh, like Swipe or something else like that, or Voice or, or you know, uh, some of these really forward-looking forward things. And it also doesn't solve the problem of, you know, um, you know I, I want to edit when I'm offline or when I'm not connected to the Internet. But it does solve the problem of, you know, I, I want to compose things in, in Google Docs and have a collaborative editing process and then move that into my CMS, right? Because if you have a, if you, if you have a content ser server, you could conceivably have your, your collaborative editing there and then just push that, push that content into uh, whatever site it's going to. That, the, other, the other value of having a content server, and a lot of people are making distros that do this, is that you can, you can push to several different sites. You can have, a, you know, if you have a, a, an architecture, an inf enterprise infrastructure with, with many sites, you can, you can push your content to the site that you want to push it to, but all of your authoring lives in one place, especially if you, this is nice if you have, you know, if you have content authors who are, who are publishing things to multiple different sites. It, it, it improves workflow and a lot of other things like that. 
But then the other path is, is client-side authoring. You know, is there a way that we could, that we could move authoring to the client side? Could we, could we do it through an app? Could we do it through you know, a, 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 a richer use of, you know, of, of local storage or some other technological uh, means where we can move things into the client and have, give people the ability to, to both edit offline and then also um, to be able to ha avail themselves of a lot of these kind of you know, connections to the device that you don't necessarily get when you're just in, uh, a, tr in a traditional browser situation. So, um, you know, I've, I've mapped out some of the pros and cons that I think, um, you know, uh, these kind of uh, solutions might have, but I'd love to hear, you know, w when I open up for questions, uh, other people's ideas as well. So, uh, you know, I, I'm thinking that when you, when you have things on a content server, you have all of your content in one place, you have a cano canonical record of content, you have, as I said, better workflow, it's better for multi-channel deployment, um, but we're still fighting with the device controls. You can't work offline. Uh, you still have to migrate local content if you wrote something on your, in, on your local device. But um, if you're authoring locally, you can have all your content in one place also, but you have a single authoring environment. Um, if you have something that works in a similar way to, say, for instance, Evernote or, or Dropbox, you can actually have collaborative editing through, through, a, through, a, through a, a, an application, um, but you can also have that, uh, that, that local experience where it has all of those databases, remember, that are sort of remembering your, you know, your information and how you swipe and how you speak and, you know, and, how you, and, and, and something that you said last week and, 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 and keeping that locally in a database. It's also more customizable and you can work offline and you can publish to any system. Publishing to any system, I think, is one of the really most exciting parts of this because if, if we have, a, if we have a, 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 a system whereby you can edit and enter and author your content locally, who's to say that that couldn't publish to Drupal but then also to Joomla or to WordPress or to Typo3 or to some other CMS, um, you know, and, 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 and just by, you know, by hooking into their REST schema of, what, of whatever their fields are. And, and pulling that down into your into your local environment, um, and then you, again the, the personalization, the algorithms that the that the, that are put together about you that describe how you edit, how you do things. Right. The cons of this is, well, it's not Drupal. You know, that's another application. Um, you know, um, and you know how how does that mesh with Drupal? You know, how does that, how do we do something like that as a community? Um, and then also there are there are cons around collaborative editing. It's probably going to be quite difficult to do that. Uh, and, um, and, and does it dilute the power of Drupal as a CMS, right? If we, if we move, if we think about the place where people do, are doing their content authoring and editing as, as outside of the CMS, are we, are we sort of taking away something f uh, fundamental from Drupal? Um, you know, so those are some of the questions so, uh, that, uh, that, that, that arise, you know, around this. And, um, but you know, one of one of the uh, one of the notes uh, uh, about about uh, the app experience is we already created an app for authoring content in an I, at least an iOS app for authoring content in Drupal. Um, Acquia built this app called um, the Drupal Gardens uh, app, um, and this is available for for pushing content into DrupalGardens.com. But it can also be used um, to to push uh, Drupal content into any site. So this is something that could be built on top of or sort of extended. Uh, to to do a lot of these things, um, and uh, as I said before, uh, you know, on the content server side, there there are a lot of distros that are already doing that. Um, so, uh, but then th there's also the question: Does it need to be an app, or can we just make a more open, restful kind of sort of endpoint for accepting uh, content and allow people to just create their own kinds of apps that will sort of be able to feed content, or you know, pull the Pull the schema of a, of a content type with all of its fields locally, edit that in whatever system you have, and then, and then push that back up into Drupal. I, 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 can see, I could easily see with Drupal 8, now that we have um, you know, uh, rest in Drupal 8, that happening uh, much more easily. So um, you know, obviously there's implications also for staging uh, collaboration and workflow, but there are, there are apps out there like, um, like Firepad, for instance, which is a, which is a client side editing app that, that allows you to collaboratively edit, um, you know, locally on your device and do it, um, 
you know, uh, um, do it in real time just like you can in Google Docs, but then, uh, and this is an open source app as well. Um, so I don't know if it's GPL v3 or v2, but it's, um, it's definitely uh, open source and available on GitHub. So that, there's a lot of, you know, interesting questions there, and I'd love to hear, you know, um, what, uh, what, what people have to say. I can see some people filtered out. I think, you know, they really wanted to hear more about the semantic stuff or the, um, you know, the, the content strategy and WYSIWYG stuff. But um, like I said, there's a lot of that in, there's going to be a lot of that in Jeff's session, which I encourage everybody to go to um, because he's going to talk about, you know, the, you know, how we chunk up our data once we've got it into the system. Um, but I'd love to hear people's opinions uh, and questions about, uh, about, uh, about uh, what, I've, what I've talked about so far. So uh, with that, um, open up. Any, any, anybody have any uh, um, sort of thoughts on the, uh, you know, the, the um, modes of input or, you know, the different, uh, different ideas? Hi. Yeah? Uh, Peter with Four Kitchens. Um, hey. So uh, I don't know if there's, I don't, this is a very open-ended question, and I don't know if there's a very good answer, but I'm, I'm curious to know your thoughts. Um, given the need to chunk up our data and provide more structured content, um, what, kind of, what kind of impact does that have on what you have discussed here, um, providing a better experience um, for authoring, um, and where you do that, whether you do that locally or on a server, what... Right. I mean, so I think, like you know, uh, you know, as I was sort of alluding to at the end, I think that the the fact that the fact that the the structured data model is there in Drupal, um, at least outside of the body field. I think Jeff is going to talk more about you know when you get into the body field and how how, how do we make how do we chunk up that content, um, uh, but outside of the body field, uh, we we have we have all of the structured fields there. And any system that's inputting inputting content that's on the client side is going to be feeding it into into those fields. So it's really just the job of that system to sort of make sense of that for for the user to to make sure that they that they have a clear understanding of the structure of the data. And in a sense, I think that that's that that's going to be easier uh, for 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 a lot of these um, you know systems because it's abstracted away from the actual site. Right, you know, when you're in Drupal and you're actually editing your content, um, you, you you're very much connected to sort of previewing it in the site and seeing you know seeing what it's going to look like, and then you know you're you're kind of it's it's getting mixed up with the presentation to a certain extent. When you abstract it away and you're editing it locally, you're you're literally looking just at the content. You're not looking at any of the presentation. You may go and preview it. You know, or push it, you know, push it up to a staging uh, site, and then preview what it's going to look like. But you're just seeing the 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 chunks, so to speak, right there in front of you. So I think it's, in a sense, it's better for semantic, uh, um, you know, content creation than than a lot of the experience that we have right now. Does that answer your question, or? Yeah, I mean, it was very very open ended. I'm just curious to know your thoughts. Cool. I'd be curious if anybody had any ideas around or thoughts around, you know, what I what I talked about in terms of the, um, uh, you know, in terms of uh, the co content server ideas and, and you know and editing on the client side or in, in fact any experience working with systems that that do editing on the client side. But anyway, go ahead. I guess um, my concern. I own a small agency in Boston uh -huh. who develops only Drupal sites, and our struggle is getting our clients to put their content in, but they, it, I guess my concern with the methods that you've described is that for non-technical users, you know, when they, we're trying to get them to link things and create calls to action, I would see them having a lot of difficulty with the methods you described. You know, are they gonna type out a href, blah, 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 or whereas if they're in Drupal, they can just use Linkit or some other tool to easily link things up. So uh -huh. I, I guess, my feeling is the content shouldn't be completely abstracted from the presentation because, in, for example, in one of the sessions yesterday, they talked a lot about you know, proper use of headings, bullets, links, and so on to make your content really usable and really legible. So I guess these are the questions I'm struggling with. Uh -huh. Curious about your thoughts. Right. So, you're, so 
I'm not, I'm not totally certain I understand your 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 your, your comment about the about links or about sort of exposing the you know the the um, the markup to the user. Are you saying that you want them to see, you want them to see the markup or you want them no. to No. But if they were I guess if they were working collaboratively on their content in one of these apps you described, how would they put in their H2s? How would they put in links? How would they put in bullets? in the content as they're working on it. Ultimately, they have to, uh, our clients who are very non-technical would have to be injured to do those things. Right, right, right. So, um, so that's a really, that's a really important question. And, you know, I, I think that, you know, when you get into the body field, right, and, um, you know, you, you are creating uh, content that is already essentially marked up in HTML, um, uh, all of the sort of filters and all of the kind of you know, all, all of access to all of that stuff is going to need to be there, regardless of whether you're on the client side or on the um, or on the uh, or, or or on your Drupal site. But um, you know, you you can't you can't not have that. You can't just have it sort of plain text, and then once it gets up to once it gets up to Drupal, then that's where it gets formatted. That's essentially the same problem that I talked about before. The formatting tools, the WYSIWYG tools, have to be there on the client side, just as they are. You know, just that, just as they are, uh, you know, now in Drupal 8. Um, but we just have to have a, an ability to um, to transfer that information, you know, to sync that information back to the to to, to, to Drupal. We we would need to if you had if you used a client side uh, system. I see. So you're suggesting make sure that, like, let's say they're using Evernote, that every every piece of formatting that they do in Evernote would translate directly to HTML. Ideally, yeah. Okay. Yeah. How? Um, <laughs> I mean, that's so. What I'm talking I'm... about is that is is that we need to work on figuring out ways that we can extend things like the things like the 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 the, um, the content uh, Drupal content creation app that I showed you, mm -hmm. um, and also uh, you know build modules, build um, build things that extend Drupal to to kind of cope with these issues. You know, mm -hmm. uh, work on work on ways that we can stage and preview content. Um, and and ways that we can remove steps from this process, you know, as you know, as 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 contrib in in in, in Drupal right now. I mean, for the the solutions for your content authors right now um, are, uh, you know, we, we've gone a long way to solving those. So if you get, for instance, um, are you, you are you mainly working with Drupal seven sites? Yes. So, um, are you using are you using the new versions of CK Editor, and are you using Edit Module? Are you using those those kind of tools? Yeah, yeah. So, it's it's not so much the Drupal setup that I'm concerned about. That part's fine. It's that when dealing with these very non technical clients and getting them like I'm try, always trying to figure out what's the best way to shepherd them through the content creation and import process. Yeah, and so. For example, I would see the kinds of clients we're working with, I would see them much, much less likely to be entering content on an app, on a mobile device. I'd see them more likely to plug in a bunch of stuff into a big Excel spreadsheet and then import that into Drupal. Like that's, <laughs> that would actually yeah. be a lot handier for them. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because especially if, let's say it's, um, let's say we're not even talking about the body field, it's just filling out all the different fields for each kind of content type they'd be happier you know, just filling in an Excel spreadsheet and then going right. from there. It's interesting that you bring up this thing about an Excel spreadsheet, though, because one of the things that I think that we have not dealt with uh, efficiently uh, yet in, um, in, in, in 8, which I would love to see somebody actually start working on a module for this, is tables in the body field, right? So um, uh, Google has dealt with this really quite neatly so far um, from, from what I've seen you you know when you have a table of data in your in your in your in your body field you should be able to bring the data in and display it as a table in the body field but in fact what often happens is exactly what you just said you know a, a spreadsheet gets like sort of copied and pasted uh, all of the rows and columns and it's not linked to the data anymore it's 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 you know it's removed from the data um, so uh, you know that's something that we really need to think about, which is you know if it's data, it should still be data. You know it should be you know it should retain its you know 
its, its, its integrity. Yeah, you know, that's really interesting because I just had a conversation with a prospective client who has a Drupal site already, and they did this. And I'm really hoping we get a chance to work with them to see... I think they wrote a custom module that did it. Oh, so it really? Had, it has a huge table of technical information on their products within the body field, but it's still linked up to the database. Uh -huh. So I'll give you my card and if I find out anything more about yeah, it. That would be awesome. Yeah, thank you. Cool, thank you. Hi. Uh, this is not a Drupal question, but I am an avid user of Swipe Keyboard. Uh -huh. And I was very intrigued by your circular or hexagonal prototype or mock-up that uh -huh. you presented for the swipe keyboard. Is that something that you designed, or it is? Actually. Is that something you've taken further than just a picture? Uh, not yet. Okay. Too bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a lot of solutions out there, though. Actually, that 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 are going in that direction. Um, so there's, for instance, there's one that has. Um, uh, a kind of a, a square, a, a square setup, and it's not so much. It's not, but it's not exactly swipe. It uses a sort of a flick, where you start from the middle and then flick out towards the um, the, the 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 letter that you want. And it, it, but it does radial. this, yeah. Sort of a radial approach, right? right? Exactly. But it but it does the same thing of grouping the most commonly used letters in the in the center. So there's a there's a few solutions out there, but it's like this is all sort of very kind of very very much in flux, and we're sort of in a very innovative um, evolutionary phase of, 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 of input, I think. So. If it were possible for me to use Swipe for all of my input on any device, I would do that all the time. I, I, really? I love it. So I'm, yeah. I'm excited about the future of that sort of, of touch text input. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Thank you. So this isn't a, really a question. It's more kind of a what if since we're being all futuristic her and everything, right? I, I tend to be pretty futuristic. That's kind of kind of what I do. To, to me, the most simplest, the closest you could get to to the input to the user would be to sit and watch them as they type. So something sitting in the client side, recording every single thing you're typing, and then computer learning being able to say, "Hey, do you want to put this on your website? Do you want to email this?" And then being able to do that and being able to let the computer try and figure out and suggest from what it's learned from, like you were talking about, your past behaviors, where does this go? Because really the ideal experience is to type once. Right. And then just tell it where to go or have it even suggest where to go from well, there. Yeah, and I think, I think we are, you know, one of the great things about Drupal is that, is that, you, is that it, it is very dry in terms of content. Um, if, you, if you write something, right, um, you can reuse that thing in a view any number of times, or you know, put you know, you can you can take that exact same field and and and, and repurpose it in any number of different ways and push it out uh, via multi-channel, uh, you know, to in JSON or, or or whatever XML to 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 any other kind of device. So you're not really re you're not repeating yourself. You're not you're not writing the same thing over and over again in many 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 different uh, many different places. And I think that we have that really over over any other system, um, but I think what you what you say is really absolutely true. You know that we we need to sort of get more sort of get closer to the to to the to the end user to the to the the person who's actually creating content. Yeah, because how many times do you know my users they type things in Word documents first. Right, and then, like you're saying, they're copy and pasting, or they're copying it. They're putting it in an email, and then uh -huh. they're copying and pasting it. Yeah. You know, if you could have something that just sat and watched and said, "Oh, she just scheduled an event at such and such date. Hey, do you want to put this on the website?" Mm -hmm. And then figured that out. Well, that goes to the semantic, um, you know, stuff as well, because, you know, if you're t if you're talking about. Um, you know, an event, which is a, which is a kind of an entity. It's like uh, there's a schema.org entity event, um, and if you, if you're structuring your content types in that way, then you know, then something that is an event is all is, it should automatically be, um, you know, if you if you have the content strategy structured correctly, be, you know, getting pushed into the right place so that if anybody who wants to discover that event can find it. So. Um, Knowing that somebody's about to create an event, something that's an event is an, is a, is another sort of, yeah. you know, predictive kind of uh, predictive analytics kind of problem. But it but it's de definitely interesting. Okay. Thank you. 
All right. Is, did I, do you have one more question? Can you, go, can you go back to the slide about the client side authoring? Uh, the pros and cons, sorry. Oh, this one? Hold on. One sec. One for the client side one, I guess. Right. There we go. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, a lot of this is like, you know, it, because, it's, because it's very speculative and sort of, you know, and forward looking, knowing what, you know, knowing w what the proper technical solution is, is, is tricky, but, but I'd, I'd love to hear, you know, any thoughts you had on that. Yeah, so you kind of talked about like all the content being in one place in a single authoring environment. I guess kind of where my mind went was you're likely going to be on multiple devices. So I'm in an airport, I'm authoring on my phone, I get to my hotel, I pull out my laptop, things like that. And so right, right, right. there's still an element of local, but it's almost kind of a distributed approach in that you need to sync those devices so that... Right, right, you know, right. So it's like you, what you want is you want a multi you, you want a multi device approach like an Evernote kind of a thing yeah. where you have where you have the same application right available yep. to you in multiple devices that then syncs back to right to your you know to your to your content uh, to your content hub right yep. so that you know everything is everything is getting is getting added back maybe lazily in the background right uh -huh. um, you know but but you have access to it wherever you are. So like you said, if you're on your phone, it's going, you know, you're, you're making notes, then later on when you get home, you, op you open it up on your, on your, on your tablet or your, or your laptop or whatever, um, and then you go into it in more depth and detail, but it's the same, it's the same app that's following you around. I mean, I think that's, that's really what needs to happen. Right, and I think that also maybe helps to address a little bit of those collaborative problems as well. If you can start syncing to other people's devices, some right. content, you potentially address some of those. Yeah. Um, I think the other interesting thing is thinking about the format of the content that's coming into that central location. So if I can support multiple formats, whether it be HTML, whether it be Markdown, et cetera, right. translate that into some pure canonical type form, mm -hmm. it's almost multi-channel input as well <laughs> that, that you can then translate into multi-channel output. Right. So that was just some things that were... Well, so that head. fire pad that, 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 that you got, that you were looking at a minute ago, um, that supports Markdown. So, um, and it also is, you know, it's, it's restful. So, you mm -hmm. know, you, it, it's a question of, of, of getting the APIs to, um, you know, to make sure that you can, uh, you know, you can communicate with those, or integrations so that those things can, can communicate with Drupal. Right. You know, yep. so... Uh, Right, right. There, I mean, they were, to me, you're talking about you're going to translate HTML and do something else that is more basic than that. I don't well, and it may not be, it may be translating other things into HTML. It's just kind of decide what is that central format that you want to be able to translate things to that you can then translate from yeah. as well. The, I mean, I think the, re, the, 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 the use case of Markdown, the, thing, the reason why people use Markdown is because as far as I understand, is because it's 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 more it's a rapid it's like a shorthand HTML really it's like I can do I can do it quickly, um, you know with some you know with some quick keyboard, uh, you know commands and 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 get something that's a lot more sort of lightweight and simple than having to go in and 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 and, and laboriously write all of my all of my tags, so, you know, it it essentially can be can be translated right into HTML so it's I think. You know, I think it, it's not any less semantic. I could be wrong on that, <laughs> uh, but I, I would, believe I, that I believe that Markdown is not less semantic than HTML. So, so anyway, thank thank you all for uh, for coming along. And uh, again, go to uh, go to uh, Jeff's uh, WYSIWYG session as well because that's going to cover very many uh, uh, of this of the sort of content strategy and semantic issues. That I, that I didn't talk about, so uh, I'm going to be there as well. So thanks a lot.